texts of the highest text to some of the not you know sutra texts, tantra texts, they say we're Buddha. Why aren't we yet Buddha? Well, I'll answer this by quoting some one of my favorite quotes. It's not a Buddhist quote, but it comes from somebody we should know about in India, Aurobindo. He's speaking about something else, but it perfectly, I feel, encapsulates our problem as potential Buddhas. He's speaking about India and its situation in 1909, okay? It's still under the British. And he's a very intelligent man, Aurobindo, and a very spiritual man. He says, the 19th century, the 19th century in India was three things, self-forgetful, imitative, artificial. It aimed at a successful reproduction of Europe in India. Okay, he's talking about something else, but I would say our lives are completely at the moment, largely self-forgetful, forgetting we're Buddhists, imitative, so we start imitating things which are not us, we don't know what to do. So we imitate actors, we imitate this, we imitate that, we imitate idiots, we imitate warmongers, we imitate people who are not in touch with their Buddha nature. And if we imitate anything which is not our true nature, we're going to suffer. And then we become artificial. You understand what artificial, sorry I didn't bring the death dictionary definition of artificial, but it means uh, it's an artifice, it's, it's a make-believe, it's something not really, it's not real, it's not really us, it's not what we are, you know? So we are self-forgetful, we imitate, and we become artificial. So we have a lot of artificial needs, don't we? How many of the things that you see in the shops, that you see advertised, do you really need in your life? let alone the ones that are going to help us as we die. What do we really need? You know? I'm going to consult my phone, not because I want to call someone, because I photograph something. These things are quite useful. I wanted to check, before I started talking today, what the definition of sabotage is. Okay? How can you talk about self-sabotage and not know what a good dictionary says about the word? It's interesting, the definition. <clears throat> Quite interesting. Uh, so, sabotage, this is from uh, Chambers Dictionary, which I've been using for 40 years. <clears throat> Malicious or deliberate destruction or damage of machinery, etc. Uh, yeah, we are a kind of machinery, right? By discontented workers, rebels, etc. So you can identify the discontented workers and rebels in our minds and lives. Okay, we have to, oops, now this technology is such that the fingertip makes it move. Action taken to prevent the fulfillment of any plan or aim, etc. Action taken to prevent the fulfillment of any plan or aim. I would interpret that to mean that the fulfillment of the of our plan or aim is becoming a Buddha. That's our true aim. That's our potential. So most of what we do is going against that potential we have of becoming a Buddha. Person who is awake. It doesn't mean someone with robes who you know bows down to his holiness Dalai Lama every day. It means someone who's woken up completely. You don't have to be a Buddhist to wake up completely. Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. Can you imagine? <laughs> he wasn't a Buddhist. He didn't go to any Dharma center. He roamed around half naked in forests. Probably looked a bit like Gandhiji, except different color robes, possibly. You know, and at some point he looked totally emaciated, like, you know, some, you know, poor worker you see lying on the road in Chandni Chowk or something. Except he was usually sitting upright under trees. Luckily, there are a lot of trees left then in North India, not like now. He wandered around, you know. If we'd seen him, we'd have been upset, possibly. Put off. Long hair, unshaven, possibly, before he became a monk and then decided, you know, and then what is monk? Monk was, there were no actual monks then, in a sense. He was what he was. He wasn't a Buddhist. He was a Buddha. He was awake. Okay, I just wanted to make that point. Christ wasn't a Christian. 
Some would say, thank goodness. You know, the degeneration comes later. He was just, a, again, a very awakened person, compassionate person. So, <clears throat> where was I? Where was I? I was asking who we were, and we become self-forgetful, imitative, artificial. I think these three words are amazing. If we analyze this in terms of not only history, which is what uh, Aurobindo was doing. And you see, what he went on to say was that you have to follow your own svadharma, your own true path in life. He felt there was an Indian way of living, which was genuine. He said we have the foreigners, the, the, the British in this case mainly, are imposing a lifestyle on us because they want to use us, dominate us, and use us for their profit. Some, of course, there's some very good British people here. Of course there were. But their main aim was profit, wasn't it? East India Company, Kaikiliya. They didn't come here to, of course, they came to some to try and convert us because they felt we were heathens and needed converting. They thought all of our wisdom culture was garbage. And Macaulay said all of our wisdom culture of India isn't even equivalent to one volume of European wisdom. You know, this is what they thought about our great culture, which now, thanks to the Tibetans, we are discovering what is our great culture, at least the Buddhist part of it. So, I don't want to get too political here. Anyway, I think this is an important point. We mustn't forget our wisdom culture and become imitative and artificial. And that's what we're becoming in India. And of course, all over the world, people have become imitative and artificial. Because the power of advertising and so on and so forth is so strong. And when you open the newspapers, you see violence, greed, epitomized. So you don't see stories so much about bodhicitta bodhisattva qualities and people benefiting others. You don't see that. Okay. A quotation. I'll be quoting Buddha and I'll be quoting modern masters. I want to quote something from a very interesting book. I would recommend, of course, any book by um, my own teacher, but also by uh, Situ Rinpoche. He's a great lama. He teaches at uh, Tushita usually once or twice a year. He's the teacher of the Kamapa, traditionally, historically. They teach each other life to life. So, uh, very great Lama. The last talk he gave here was uh, actually expressing his concern, in a way, at what's happening in the 21st century. He gave us a lot of quotations and figures about what we're doing to ourselves on this planet. Uh, this is a book he wrote some time back called Relative World, Ultimate Mind. Uh, still available, I'm sure, as an Indian edition. Came out first in 1992 and first published in India by Penguin in 99. Very worthwhile leave, uh, reading this, very masterful book. He says at one point this, in his chapter on healing the mind. Development is not a bad thing, he says. I'm putting it in context, yeah? What we're talking about, self-sabotage, we have to put it in a social context, historical context. That's why I'm reciting this. Development isn't a bad thing. But the problem is that the development we see around us has happened so fast. Even in the most thoroughly modern countries, things have not been advanced for very long. It's a recent phenomenon which took place in the last hundred years or so, or less. If you compare how much change has occurred in the last hundred years with how much occurred before that, it seems incredible. A recent period of change is equivalent to maybe several thousand years of previous change. The natural way of life went on with slow developments over millions of years before it suddenly speeded up. We could say it really speeded up yeah, with the Industrial uh, Revolution and so forth, end of the 18th century in England. If we are honest with ourselves, he says, we should be happy that we are not all in a state of total nervous breakdown or insanity. I hope nobody here feels they are already in a state of nervous breakdown, insanity, anyone? Anyway, you probably wouldn't want to admit it. Sometimes we feel close. We should be happy that we are okay. We are going fast, but we have somehow been able to catch up. It is this situation, though, that has brought the development of psychology and psychotherapy. People who grow up in a changed, more artificial environment, have difficulty understanding that life is simple. 
everything becomes very complicated for them. Modern people, I can't say. Everything becomes very complicated for them. Especially such things as love, caring for themselves and other people, having balanced relationships, discipline, and so forth. Such basic states as happiness, sadness, death, and birth all become very complicated. Don't they? Even though they might have a lot of materials to learn from, like books and video cassettes that discuss every critical aspect of life, it is indirect learning. They may read a hundred books and still be confused. I can relate to that. People who have grown up with nature might not have seen any books. And they might not have the ability to explain what love, respect, or kindness is. But they know and feel these principles in a way that gives them stability. Go up into the hills to still places maybe, Spiti, Kinor, Lahu, some places, Bhutan, simple people, maybe never read a book. Maybe never learn to read. You'll find something in those people that we don't have. And many people don't have in the city. Because we've become self-forgetful, artificial, imitative, divorced from nature, divorced from real beauty. I was recently in Bhutan. I was amazed by the beauty. Not just of the natural environment, but they take pains to keep beauty in their architecture. I did not honestly see one really ugly building in Bhutan. And I went to the capital and the, and the other big cities, the other towns, some of them. No ugliness. They don't allow ugliness in one sense. It has to be according to certain standards of beauty, their traditional architecture, beautiful woodwork, painting, and so forth. I say fantastic. It's easier to do in a small country. They have a small population. But, you know, you see how it helps the mind to be in an environment where there is beauty, where there is simplicity, where there is 72% forest cover. Except for the areas next to India where, thanks to Indian contractors and their mates in Bhutan, there is a smuggling going on of timber, thanks to us Indians. And some greedy people in Bhutan. They're also human beings. They're not saints, all of them. But you see, this natural environment, where life we're losing. So, they have and these principles in a way that gives them stability. The professional therapist has originated from the need of modern people to find answers for all those major questions that didn't need to be asked in the past. People knew the answer naturally. They lived it. Nowadays, the simple things that people once knew naturally have become areas of uncertainty. What areas? Love relationship, you know, caring for oneself, caring for other people. We've forgotten how to care for ourselves. Why? Because it's the demand of the market. You get up a certain time, you have to go to work, you have to sit in an office in an artificial environment with artificial machinery giving off various negative vibrations which are not good for a human body. Okay for a robot, not for a human body. And we have to do that for longer hours than most people had to work in the past, in the name of I don't know what, efficiency or inefficiency probably, also in India. Inefficiency, so things that could be done quicker aren't done, even though we have laptops in front of us. You know? And the person comes home tired, then what do you do? You don't put together a nutritious meal when you come home tired, you put together something quickly, or something that you made a few days ago or yesterday and put in the fridge. Stale food, read about stale food in our own wisdom culture. Eh? What Ayurveda has to say about food in the fridge. We say, ah, nahi, kharab nahi hua, Thiki hai. Taste is okay, warm it up. You know? Parathas could have been in the freezer for months. My aunt believes in them. May even think they're tastier after a few months in the freezer. <laughs> Maybe. But other aspects of the paratha have changed because impermanence is also a, a rule of life. They don't stay the same in the freezer. They may taste the same or better. 
and you know, meat's in the freezer, and this is in the freezer, and we're so proud of our freezers. Of course, we get upset when there's a la long power cut, and our inverter isn't working or strong enough, but you know, what the heck? Challenges are there. So, you know, like that, artificial lifestyle, and Rinpoche is saying it's amazing we're not all insane yet. Of course, some lamas will say we are insane. We are insane already. We just don't know it. And Lord Buddha knew we are insane. That's why he gave his teachings, because he knew we had forgotten our Buddha nature, who we really are, and we need a lot of help. One of the first things they taught us when I first met Tibetan Buddhism was that if you listen to teachings, the first attitude you must have is that I am a sick person. I am a sick person. The person teaching me is like a doctor. What he's teaching me, the dharma, is medicine. Buddha is the great physician who has given this medicine, which is coming through this present doctor, the teacher. It's part of a lineage of doctors going back to the time of the Buddha. I can say that in the sense that my teachers, who are valid, realized people, have their lineage going back to the time of the Buddha. So this is medicine. May we take the medicine, that's part of it. I must take this medicine to become well. But we start with that. I'm a sick person. How can we claim that we are not sick people if we get angry at the smallest thing, get attached and grasp at so many things, become jealous at the drop of a hat, become anxious and fearful? Why should we be like that when all the great saints of the past have said that we are basically spiritual beings trapped in an ordinary life and body? and have the potential to become fully awake and a Buddha. You know, of course we're sick, totally sick. We're insane because we're artificial, imitative, because we've forgotten who we are. It's like a lion. Imagine a lion who, due to various conditions or you know, his parents having abandoned him, grew up among sheep, thinks he's a sheep. Bah, bah, you know? Someone who can roar and terrify all the other animals Imagine him growing up trying to imitate sheep, man, man, a lion. Imagine that situation. Wouldn't that be sad? You'd laugh. This noble beast, king of the jungle, pretending to be a sheep. Thinks he's a sheep, really deep down, feels he's a sheep. Doesn't have a mirror, you see. Doesn't have a mirror. Hasn't looked in pools, still pools of water long enough to see that I'm very, very, very different from a sheep doesn't know. So dharma, we say, is like a mirror to us. The dharma is a mirror. It shows us our defects, but also shows us our potential. It shows us who we really are. How to see yourself as you really are, that's also the title of a book by His Holiness. But another way to see ourselves how we really are is to see that we are Buddha, and to look at the teachings on Buddha nature. Goodness me, is it really? 11.32? Uh, anyone at the back can see if there's some sort of refreshments at the back for people, like tea container or something? Is there anything? Yes. Usually there is. So we'll stop in a few minutes for a little break. Apologize. Once I start talking, it's just my kind of verbal diarrhea. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so that's the situation. That's the situation that we're in. We are insane. The quicker we accept it in some way, the better. Another teacher put it this way. In this world, there's so much evidence of us not being able to discriminate what is wholesome, what is good for us, and what is bad for us. We, have not, we don't discriminate sufficiently. Sambal Rinpoche, very great lama, ex-prime uh, ex minister of the Tibetan government in exile, Sambal Rinpoche. Great being, great lama, great teacher, Sanskritist, probably the greatest living Gandhian there is, although he's Tibetan. Um, <clears throat> he says, we are insane. In his book, one of his books, he says, we're insane. Because we don't know what is good for us, what is bad for us. All we do is what is bad for us, in terms of our lifestyle, the way we work, the way we come home, the way we eat, the time we go to bed, the time we wake up, the garbage we often eat, the mental pollution we allow ourselves to, to engage in, disturbing our own minds and then disturbing others with our useless chatter and often very harmful speech and our negative thoughts, torturing ourselves, worrying ourselves often to death or to heart attacks. 
you know, with our anger, our, 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 our greed, our jealousy. We keep on comparing ourselves with others. Why do we compare ourselves with others, by the way, all the time? Why are we competitive? Why are we comparing ourselves with other people in a very anxious way, you know? Because, you know, we want to feel that we're at least okay or better or, you know. Why do we do this? It's lack of faith in who we are, isn't it? Why would we want to compare all the time when we feel okay about ourselves? When we feel, yeah, I'm a potential Buddha. I have challenges, I have problems, but basically I'm good. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm temporarily insane, yes, but basically I'm good. I'm temporarily insane, not insane through and through, not by nature, not fundamentally, temporarily. We speak of adventitious or temporary delusions. By nature, our mind is clear, clean, like space. It is pure, it is unlimited, it is omniscient, it is blissful. It is Buddha. That's the nature of our mind. We compare because we're caught up in all of this superficial garbage, what my Lama Yeshe would call garbage, garbage thoughts. Would you agree at all? Am I communicating? Sorry, I feel sometimes I'm talking to myself. Am I communicating? Yes, yes. Does it mean something or is it just completely nonsense? Tell me if you feel it's nonsense. I'll try and say it in another way. Does it make sense to us? Yes. Okay, good. So the point is we can do something about it. We can do something about it. We're not helpless. You know, when we were children we were helpless. This is something important too. We often carry on that childhood helplessness into adult life, I feel. I have, sometimes. We want big mummy daddy to help us somehow. And if we don't have big mummy daddy anymore, then we have big mummy daddy creator or someone in the sky or our partner will become someone who saves me. My Jeevan Sati. Or my mobile will save me. You know? My mobile will save me from loneliness and boredom. My Asli Jeevan Sati of 21st century India is the mobile phone. You can't bear to switch it off for more than a few minutes. It is there with us reassuringly in our hip pocket somewhere, handbag, ready to be taken out at the moment's notice and consulted. Yeah. Anyway, we have to realize, as one Lama says, we, we should feel like we are solid gold. We have a solid lump of gold in us. We are wonderful. We have the sun in our chest. That's who we are. Stop behaving like a miserable you know, lump of meat walking around on the planet. Before the tea break, I'll just quote something. Sorry, uh, Tia, you heard this yesterday. So don't get bored. Was it yesterday? What's today? Saturday. Saturday. Yesterday morning, yeah. We, had, we have a ladies' group here. By the way, we have a ladies' group Friday mornings, 11 o'clock at the Shita. Any lady is um, welcome. Not that if a man turns up by mistake, we would throw them out, because <laughs> I'm a man still. But um, yeah, ladies, yeah, ladies group for many years going. <clears throat> anyway, so this I recited yesterday. I think it's wonderful. I'm going to read it, and then anyone apart from Tia can tell me who they think wrote it, okay? That'd be interesting before tea. Tea, okay? So you quiz, Oraji, quiz, okay? Okay. Our deepest fear, okay? Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. I'm going to recite that line again. I think it's quite important, especially for me. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. Hmm. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. Hmm. 
It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. So what's going on? As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Who do you think said this? I think uh, Nelson Mandela is in Agdo's speech. Wow! How did you know that? <laughs> because I have it in one of my notes. So, and I was well, talking about good, it this week, so you're, good you're, for you. You're a sign. <laughs> good for you. I have my little, what, kind, of, kind of little enlightened scrapbook of things that inspire me. We should all have a book like this. I've put down all the Dharma quotes and other things from different kind of people that inspire me, make me feel good and confident that I'm not just a useless lump of meat walking around on the planet. <laughs> I'm not an artificial, self-forgetful, imitative idiot. I am, but I'm more than that also. Partly I'm that, for sure. I'm not yet awakened. I'm an idiot, but I'm an idiot who knows I'm an idiot and can become beyond idiot. Buddha. Well, that's the main thing, right? We should agree that we are sick, but the sick person should realize that with a good doctor, you can become well. Good doctor, good medicine. And taking the medicine. I, liked, I used to like buying medicine, <laughs> putting it on the shelf. Looks good, you know, you have the packet. It looks good, you know. You can show people. <laughs> they can move in each other. It didn't go in my mouth. So then stupid. Absolutely stupid. Anyway. Okay, let's have a tea break, please.